Thank you for joining us this morning, both in person and online. Uh, Last week was great to have uh, Mark and Melissa Young with us to encourage us and to share with us uh, about their return to Manila, Philippines as Alliance workers, getting back to, after a couple of years being kind of sidelined because of COVID, getting back to the work that they are engaged in there. Um, And it is... Uh, our delight to be able to announce to you that as a church, we are going to be uh, supporting them on a regular basis. So uh, we want you to know that. And uh, we're going to be giving to them monthly, which also opens up for anyone as individuals. They're a designated, what do you call it? A A designated special gift. So if you wanted to give through the church, you could. Um, So we'll be adding them to that as well. It's good that Mark last week brought us a great challenge to consider. What is our kingdom legacy? Not just individually, but corporately. What is Max Millard Alliance Churches? That's hard to say. Millard Alliance Churches. uh, Kingdom legacy. What mandate are we receiving from the Lord and passing on to the next generation? What baton is being passed along? Are we only passing along some lifeless religious traditions? No, of course not. We are passing on a vibrant three-dimensional faith of transformational relationship with our creator, connectedness like this with one another in the family of God in Christ-centered community and fruitfully engaging our world, the world around us, in the power of the Holy Spirit. And when we say that, engaging our community or engaging the world around us, I had a great conversation last week. Somebody asked me, what do you mean by that? As, especially for those of us who live far away. Well, there's probably three dimensions to that too. Engaging the world around you is, yes, we're planted in a particular place, this, this box that we meet in. We recognize this box isn't the church. We are the church, but we're planted in this place for a purpose. And so one dimension of sharing is connectedness to this community. But we recognize this isn't the only place we're planted. You're planted in a home too, in a neighborhood, in a different city perhaps, in a, in a, uh, in a village, depending on where you are, out in the woods. Uh, but you've got people around you in that sphere as well. That's a second dimension that we mean every time we say engaging the world around us, your world where you live. But there might even be a third dimension of where you work or where you go to school. Now, those three spheres overlap to some degree, perhaps more for some of us than for others, they overlap. But when we say engaging your world in the power of the Holy Spirit, we mean all three dimensions. Yes, here in this neighborhood. Yes, where you live. Yes, where you work or go to school. All of those are what we mean when we say engaging our world in the power of the Holy Spirit. So we just delight and and are so thankful for um, being able to partner with Mark and Melissa Young and their continued work um, in Manila and uh, looking forward to hearing more from them as they are, they're actually taken off. Let's see, it's Melissa already left perhaps and Mark I think leaves on Monday or Tuesday for headed back. So, and his son. Um, So today we're continuing in that vein uh, as we jump into our seventh installment of Jesus' kingdom parables in our summer series entitled Kingdom Come. We're examining Jesus' teachings about the kingdom of God and we're beginning to get an understanding of the kingdom of God by looking at facets or different characteristics that Jesus teaches his followers Uh, And he did that primarily through parables. So he'd give them a little snippet in this parable, and he'd give them a little uh, glimpse in this parable. The kingdom of heaven is like, and we've seen up to this point, the kingdom of heaven is like a farmer who's sowing seeds, right? And we saw that we're supposed to be extravagantly sowing the seed. We saw that the kingdom of heaven is like a man who sowed good seeds, but the enemy was trying to sow bad seeds in that same garden. And it was Jesus' warning to the apostles, to his followers, to the disciples, be aware of the enemy's tactics, but leave 
the uprooting to God in his timing and in his manner that he sees fit. We saw the kingdom of heaven is like a mustard seed that it's got like extra potential, extra meaning outwardly focused potential that this mustard seed, though it's small, grows up into a great tree that, that provides cover and care and provision for the birds of the air kingdom of heaven we also saw is like yeast remember it needs to be needed (laughs) that the kingdom of god is being worked in and through each one of us by the work of the holy spirit and growing us up to what similarly an extra potential like extra outside of ourselves the gal that we saw in that parable who was making that uh was making that dough and the yeast. How much was it? Was some crazy amount of dough, like 60 pounds or some crazy number uh, of dough being worked through with yeast. That wasn't just for herself. And that wasn't just for her family. That was to provide uh, for many beyond herself and her own. Kingdom of heaven is like the hidden treasure. It's worth everything you give up for it. And also, at the same time, the kingdom of heaven is like the merchant who is seeking out precious jewels, like the pearl. The kingdom of heaven is like the merchant searching for precious pearls. And we also saw that not only is the kingdom of heaven the pursuit, our pursuit, but the kingdom of heaven is also our pursuer, He's chasing after you as his precious pearl. Uh, We saw that the kingdom of heaven is like a fishing net. And that it's our job, like it's our job to cast extravagant seed. It's our job to throw a big wide net and to draw as many people into the kingdom of God. To hear the word, living word of God for themselves. Last week we saw that the kingdom of heaven is like a king who forgives great debts. But he doesn't stop there. He also expects us to forgive great debts as a result, right? So, as we're going through these weeks, I'm beginning to hear rumblings. Something like this. Okay, okay, I see some of the characteristics of what Jesus calls the kingdom of God. Some of the details. But what is it exactly what is the kingdom of god okay it's like this it's like this it's like that but what is it really where is it when is it who is it perhaps all very good questions and they're coming right on time you can begin to imagine now that the crowd following jesus has some of these same stirrings right Because in one place, he gives one parable. And they're like, that's amazing. But what exactly does that mean? And then in this next place, he gives them another little facet. The kingdom of heaven is like this. That's awesome. But what what exact, right? So we can begin to feel what this crowd perhaps is feeling. The same types of stirrings and wonderings and ponderings and questions. But interestingly, Jesus doesn't give them the satisfaction of an easy answer. And so I won't either. Uh, I want us to sit a little longer with a sense that, of this feeling that the crowds must have had as they press into Jesus. They're starting to piece together this puzzle that he's laying out one Peace at a time, right? He doesn't rush to any conclusions in his teachings, does he? We will, uh, in the weeks ahead, begin to pull back from our intensely zoomed-in view of the kingdom of God, and we'll get a broader picture and address some of those very questions, but not today. Not today. Turn with me to Matthew chapter 20. We'll open up, and we'll get as far as we can in the next few minutes. Matthew chapter 20. The parable of the workers in the vineyard. Verse 1. 
verse 1. For. Okay, there's my first point. For. Whenever you have a new chapter and a new paragraph that starts with the word for, what do we have to, or before, or therefore, in Scripture, what do we have to do? We got to ask ourselves the question, what is that for, therefore? Right? What is therefore, therefore? It throws us backwards all the time. So it makes us understand that we're coming into the middle of a thought or a conversation or an instruction. And this one is showing us, as it throws us back, that we're following on the heels of Jesus' conversation with the rich young ruler who was seeking to learn from Jesus, what good things must I do in order to inherit eternal life? And Jesus takes the opportunity of this man's question to drill down into one area of the man's life that he had raised up as an idol that stood between himself and his Messiah and eternal life in Christ and obedience to the Christ. And when the rich young ruler realized what Jesus was getting getting at, pointing to riches, I have to give it all up, he turned and walked away. And Jesus turned to his disciples and he acknowledges that it is hard for a rich man to enter the kingdom of heaven. The the disciples were so astonished, like if somebody of this social status or of this economic clout or of this cultural rank, if he doesn't make the cut, then who? What is their hope for anyone? Who could possibly, who then can be saved? So back up just a couple of verses. Matthew 19, verse 26. Jesus looked at them, the disciples, and said, With man this is impossible, but with God all things are possible. Peter answered him, Well, we, we've left everything to follow you. What will there be for us? <laughs> they're witnessing, this guy's not willing to give everything up, but we have, so what do we get? And Jesus assures them, I tell you the truth, at the renewal of all things, when the Son of Man sits on his glorious throne, you will have followed me, you who have followed me, will also sit on 12 thrones, judging the 12 tribes of Israel. And everyone who has left houses or brothers or sisters or father or mother or children or fields for my sake will receive a hundred times as much and will inherit eternal life. But many who are first will be last and many who are last will be first. So mark that verse 30, right? This is actually a, the beginning, maybe the, the, the bookend on one, on one end of this parable that we're about to read in chapter 20, because it ends with that same phrase. So the last will be first, and the first will be last, in verse 16 of chapter 20. So let's continue. In Matthew chapter 20 now, in the parable that we are addressing, for the kingdom of heaven is like a landowner who went out early in the morning to hire men to work in his vineyard. He agreed to pay them a denarius for the day and sent them into his vineyard. About about the third hour, he went out and saw others standing in the marketplace doing nothing. He told them, you also go and work in my vineyard and I will pay you whatever is right. So they went. He went again about the sixth hour and the ninth hour. And he did the same thing. About the eleventh hour, he went out and found still others standing around. He asked them, Why have you been standing here all day, all day long, doing nothing? Because no one has hired us, they answered. He said to them, You also go and work in my vineyard. When evening came, the owner of the vineyard said to his foreman, Call the workers and pay them their wages beginning with the last ones hired and going on to the first. The workers who were hired about the eleventh hour came, and each one received a denarius. So when those who were hired first came, they expected to receive more, but each one of them also received a denarius. 
When they received it, they began to grumble against the landowner. These men who were hired last worked only an hour, they said, and you have made them equal to us who have borne the burden of the work and the heat of the day. But he answered one of them, Friend, I am not being unfair to you. Didn't you agree to work for a denarius? Take your pay and go. I want to give the man who was hired last the same as I gave you. Don't I have the right to do what I want to do with my own money? Or are you envious because I am generous? So the last will be first and the first will be last. Lord Jesus, thank you for your word. And thank you for your teaching. Thank you that your words are life and they are truth. And thank you for the promise that your word will not go forth and return to you void except they accomplish what you, the purpose for which you've sent them. And so, Lord, we pray that your word would have your way in our hearts, in our minds, uh, in our families, in our church family, we pray in Jesus' precious name. Amen and amen. I submit to you today, we'll probably get through a couple of these points, we'll pick up the, ne the rest uh, next week, but what the landowner is doing in this parable and what Jesus is doing through the parable, it's like he's prescribing five sweet pills to remedy a bitter root. It reminds me a little bit of... Remember when we were studying through Revelation, and we picked up on a couple of prophets from the Old Testament as well, where the Lord tells the prophet, take this scroll and eat it. It will be sweet to your mouth, but bitter to your stomach. Uh, and this kind of reminds me a little bit of that. These five sweet pills that Jesus delivers are sweet to our mouths when we apply them to ourselves. We say, oh yeah, isn't that great of God to do that for me? And then it settles on us and we realize, wait a minute, he's expecting me to deal this same way with everyone around me. <laughs> so perhaps it's a little bittersweet, these five sweet pills, but they remedy a potential root of bitterness that we see setting in with some of these workers in the parable. So let's look at the first couple at least before we wrap up today. So the first sweet pill is this. The kingdom of heaven conscripts anyone and everyone. Like they'll hire anybody. Look at verse 3. And verse 6, like the first, guy, the first group of workers that were hired, uh, they were the early birds, right? They were the workers who were there ready to go, it seems like. But in verse 3, there's a description of the workers. What's the description? They're sitting idle. Idle. Doing nothing. That's generally not good to put on your resume. But they're hired anyway, right? How about verse 6? Standing around. They're just, they're just chewing the fat, right? Like, they're just hanging around. How come you haven't gone to work and feel, I don't know, nobody talked to us. Like, these aren't the cream of the crop, right? Necessarily. Of workers to be conscripted or hired. But the first reality that we see is that the kingdom of heaven conscripts anyone and Everyone. I mean, look at some of the questionable, questionable biblical characters that we've encountered over the last year or so. Abram, son of an idol maker. Moses, got kind of a savior complex mixed with anger management issues, right? David, great songwriter, but definitely driven by his passions. Jonah was the prophet of God who gets depressed 
and suicidal when an idolatrous city and its king actually listen to his sermon and repent. I mean, that's kind of weird. Definitely some whosoever's there, right? Like, how about, how about the New Testament? Disciples and the apostles. Talk about a motley crew, right? Fishermen, tax collectors, zealots, murderers, broken people of broken backgrounds. People that look an awful lot like me and like you, right? The kingdom of heaven will conscript anyone. Don't you ever think for a moment that you're too far gone or too broken, or too messed up for God to call you into his kingdom movement. Think about John 3.16. For God so loved the world that he gave his one and only son that, that how many, who, uh, just a few, whosoever believes in him shall not perish but have everlasting life. There's actually a test for that. If you fall, How do you know if you're a whosoever? There's a test for that. Did you know that? So you take your two fingers... And you go like this. Do you feel that? Do you feel something there? Or maybe a mirror in front of you kind of breathe a little? <gasps> like if you pass that test, you're a whosoever. Like if you still have the breath of life within you, you're a whosoever. And the kingdom of heaven will conscript whosoever will respond to the call. When we see people coming into the kingdom of God, we might be tempted to say, Ugh, what are they doing here? But the kingdom of heaven reminds us to look in the mirror and marvel, how did I get here? Only by the grace of God and his goodness toward me. So that's the first sweet pill to help me remedy a bitter root. The kingdom of heaven conscripts anyone and everyone. Number two, the second pill. Maybe I should have brought one of those little, those little pill things, right? Like the weekly pill thing. Yeah, the little flippy things. That would have been smart now that I think of it. Number two, pill number two. The kingdom of heaven calculates on its own scale. The kingdom of heaven does not run on the world's sense of fairness or equality. Look at verses two, four, five, and seven. I just about started reading chapter 21. That wouldn't have worked at all. 2, 4, 5, and 7. He agreed to pay them a denarius for the day. Remember our description of the parables in general, right? All the parables have what? What's the first element of every parable? Yeah. Yeah. The yeah. Like there's this cultural understanding. Oh, that makes sense. I get that context. I get that, um, that point that's being made. And this is certainly the yeah. He conscripted them to work for a denarius. And what's the definition of a denarius? A day's, la a day's labor. Like, he paid, this is the fair amount, right? And everybody that hears the parable says, oh yeah, that makes total sense. But then five, four, he told them, the second group, you also go to work in my vineyard and I'll pay you whatever is right. Now the audience might have been scratching their heads and saying, I, I wonder how much that is. But we get at the end, wait, they get a denarius too. That doesn't calculate on my worldly scale. What about number five, verse five? About the sixth hour, halfway through the day, and then again at the ninth hour, and then at the eleventh hour, and he pays them all the same. The kingdom of heaven calculates on a different scale than you and I calculate, or that the world around us calculates fairness and equality. The United States of America was founded with a firm belief and an inequality of opportunity and equality of value, right? Now, 
equality of opportunity, that anyone should be able to work as hard as they can to achieve a life for themselves and for their family. It hasn't been perfect. We've made egregious mistakes in our history and corrections along the way, but that was sort of a founding principle of equality of opportunity. It seems in recent years that foundation is being eroded, but the principle itself is arguably good, maybe one of the best that human governments could ever produce, fallen as we are. But the kingdom of heaven is not the government of the United States. Thank God for that, right? The kingdom of heaven calculates on a different scale calculates rewards on its own scale. Maybe you've been working your whole life for the kingdom. Maybe you just came to know Jesus in middle life. Maybe you're the thief on the cross and receive Jesus with your dying breath. Eternity with Jesus is calculated by Jesus' accomplishments, not by your accomplishments. That's how Jesus defines equality. God's goodness to us is based on his accomplishments, not on yours. And that is good news for us all. We don't work his vineyard because it earns us eternity. We work his vineyard because he has paid it all. And we delight in pouring ourselves out in gratitude for all that he has done for us already. So the kingdom of heaven conscripts anyone and you're a whosoever. And the kingdom of heaven calculates on its own scale. So those are the first two Sweet pills to remedy a bitter root. I'm tempted to keep going, but I'm not going to because we'll be here till a long time. Uh, We'll pick up the next three sweet pills that remedy the bitter root next week as we continue through. Uh, But it is my prayer this day that we would recognize as God's people Uh, as we are engaging the world around us more and more, I don't know if you've noticed, but the world and the church look more and more different every day. Have you noticed that? There was a season in American history where there was perhaps less of an outward difference between the expressions of the world and the expressions within the church. That day is long gone. I don't know that it's ever coming back. And I don't know that it was healthy that they looked an awful lot alike either back in the day. But as we reach more and more people and draw them into the kingdom of God by the power of his spirit, the lives they're coming out of are going to look a lot different than the lives we've been used to. And it's a sweet pill for us to swallow to recognize the kingdom of heaven will hire anybody. And that includes you. And that includes me. Amen? And that the kingdom of heaven calculates on its own scale. Jesus' rewards are his business to deliver in his timing to the people he so chooses. And man, We need to be uh, on the side of partying with the angels every time a sinner comes to Christ, every time a person steps in to the kingdom of God, who is they're translated from the kingdom of darkness to the kingdom of God's dear son. We need to be on the angel side of that celebration and not on these first conscripted workers. (laughs) who start rumbling within and going, wait a minute, I was here first. I should get paid more. They didn't do as much work as I did. We took on the heavy labor. And it's easy for us to do. The longer that we walk with Jesus, the more set in our personal ways we get. It's easy. 
And so the first two sweet pills that Jesus delivers to his disciples are, are a remedy, the first of five remedies for that bitter root. Let's stand together, shall we?